Welcome to the Kevin Roberts Show. We've been listening to your feedback, and I have heard, and my colleagues have heard, that you just like the conversation. So guess what? You get 100% conversation. And what a treat that one of my newest good friends since I've gotten this job, Josh Hammer, <laughs> is with us here today. So look forward to this. Josh, you are the opinion editor for Newsweek. You are one of the leaders of the conservative movement. That's not something that you would say about yourself because you're a humble guy. But in our conversation today, as you and I were just chatting off air, we're going to cover everything. So uh, we're really grateful that you're here at Heritage today for a panel on big tech, censorship, First Amendment. We'll talk a little bit about that. But just in case there's someone in this audience who does not know enough about you, tell us about the work that you're doing and why it's important in America right now. So thank you so much for having me, obviously. I mean, my only regret is that I didn't get the memo to wear jeans and cowboy boots. I could have matched you on, the, on that I sartorial almost sent you a text message and I said, no, I kind of want to see how he shows up. Um, you're also, you're way too kind, obviously. I, you know, I literally last night I was at Mar-a-Lago for Dinesh D'Souza's premiere of his new documentary, 2000 Mules, and literally walking around the um, the pool outside of Mar-a-Lago, I kind of felt like the proverbial kid in high school looking at all like the cool kids. So I don't think of myself as a leader, but it's very kind of you nonetheless. But look, for anyone who might not be familiar, so I, you know, I took over the Newsweek op-ed section two years ago, and, you know, the listeners of this podcast might very well say, Newsweek. I mean, how the hell did a right winger get into Newsweek, right? So, that's that's a whole nother story. We could, we could get we could get into that. Oh, we're but going. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I've been involved in the movement now for for a while. I mean, I worked for Ben Shapiro with the Daily Wire mm -hmm. before that. Clerked for a very conservative Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge down in Texas back when I lived there. I was super involved with right wing causes throughout my time at the University of Chicago Law School. But these days, so I, I run the op-ed section of Newsweek. I write a weekly syndicated column, which the Daily Signal, of course, is. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very grateful they are, are running it. Thanks for being part of that. Of course, it's it's my pleasure. Um, I host my own podcast in Newsweek, The Josh Hammer Show, do the whole campus speaking thing through ISI, YAF, Federal Society, and just generally trying to fight the good fight, honestly. So thanks for that explanation. The I want to key in on, on one part of that, and that is what you're doing on campuses as a, as a speaker. Have you encountered some of the really ugly episodes that so many conservative campus speakers do? I had one pretty nasty protest at Northwestern Law School, actually, this past October. Mm -hmm. So I was there to speak both at my alma mater, UChicago, and Northwestern. U Chicago, I, so I, I've gone back to speak there three or four times. I've never had a problem. Northwestern, I've now spoken there twice. There's been some sort of protest both times. I'm not really sure what exactly is in the water on that side of Chicago. But specifically what happened was in October, there were probably 30 to 40 protesters who all wore black, and they all kind of had signs. Because I was talking about my jurisprudential thesis of, quote, unquote, common good originalism. Right. And they had all these signs saying, not my common good, like boycott transphobia. They all like turned their back on me at various times in coordinated fashion in the speech. But it, I, I wasn't shouted down at least. So there was yeah. no like First Amendment issue or anything. But uh, that's I mean, I, I guess the academic in me wants to try to figure out how that protest about that thesis fits. But it's probably not worth spending time on that. So I'll move on and get to the even larger question, which is something I'm keenly interested in. And, and you and I have, have talked about this a couple of times. And that is your assessment about America today. And by that, I mean, yes, the politics, which, which you're deeply invested in. And yes, the policy, which I'm deeply invested in. But even more than that, I mean, America as a society, America as a pluralistic culture, America as this ideal that for a couple centuries and more, Americans across the ideological spectrum have believed in. But it seems as if we're sort of fraying at the edges, if not worse. What's your assessment of that? Yeah, look, I think I, I don't think it's good. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I tend to be towards the more as it currently stands. Look, so I, I try to be an optimist. OK, I'm yeah. born. I'm born Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Abraham Lincoln is my lodestar of all lodestars as far as said statesmanship, his approach to jurisprudence, all that. I'm, I'm a hardcore Lincoln guy. Lincoln, I kind of view as the eternal optimist, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you go back and read his speeches, so I really do try to channel that. But it's really hard. Sometimes it is just really, really hard, especially hard given that, you know, folks like you and I, we probably spend too much time on the Twitter sphere, which tends to just bring your mood down. But look, I mean, I look around what's, what's happened over the past two years, obviously, COVID and the way the people just totally submitted like sheeps to these, you know, arbitrary and capricious lockdowns, the vax mandates. And more generally speaking, I mean, I think what happened in the beginning of COVID, we, you know, the conservative movement, I think still to this day has not had a serious, serious looking in the mirror and kind of staring down the barrel mm -hmm. as to what we saw at the beginning with respect to what we saw, but with China and our reliance on them for PPE, personal protective equipment. I, I, I really am starting to raise some questions about the potential short-sightedness of, I think, much of what passed as kind of standard what 
boilerplate kind of libertarian infused economic policy for decades. So, I, you know, that is where I'm increasingly thinking a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I am very socially conservative. I talk about those issues all the time. But it's, it, it's, the, it's the political economy and the supply chains. And th I'm really thinking a lot about that these days. And I'm really starting to wonder whether we actually have grievously erred, honestly. Well, let's tease that out. I mean, as, as you and I have discussed before, one of the, the challenges, but I mean that in a good way, that we at Heritage have, given the length of time we've been around, given the credibility that I think we have, and I don't mean that in an institutionally arrogant way, quite the opposite, actually. But one of the challenges we have is even inside our organization, we feel the tensions that exist in the conservative movement, right? These are just tensions. They, yeah. they, they don't necessarily have to be unfriendly. They certainly aren't inside our culture. But the point is that those tensions are very present across the conservative movement, across the country. And, and what's interesting is that it's not just the one that you mentioned, which is sort of this the typical cleaving between more fiscal conservatives and social conservatives, but a new cleaving, which is between conservatives who think that the American ideal is still worth fighting for and conservatively minded people who say, man, all may be lost, that, that we might actually just have to be rebuilding our institutions from scratch. I, by, by framing it that way, and I promise I'm getting to the question because I'm really interested in your point and your, your ideas about this, I, I want to be fair to people who are in those respective camps, because I think, what, at least speaking for myself and probably most of us at Heritage, I'm very happy to be a conservative full stop, no adjective in yeah. front of the word. I respect people who have a difference of opinion there, but I think our audience would be really interested in your opinion about that because you are so thoughtful along these lines of how the movement has really been um, experienced th this fissure. So look, I mean, I to very, say a very cliche thing, but I mean, I mean, I love America. I mean, yeah. I literally carry around a pocket constitution in my backpack. I mean, you know, I- Is, I, it, is it the heritage one? Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna actually- That's okay, you don't have to answer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I do have a copy of the heritage no pressure. one. No I, have, I have like three or four different versions of it actually. Um, so look, I, 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 I love this country. I mean, I have such fond memories of childhood going to my, I grew up in a small town, okay? A mm -hmm. small town kind of 25, 30 miles north of New York City. We used to kind of deck our, our bicycles out in like red, white, and blue ribbons. Mm -hmm. And like the, the local high school band would play Yankee Doodle Dandy. And you know, it, it, that I, sounds I, awesome. It, it, like we, we, we literally had a, this sounds so like quaint these days. Yep. We literally had a contest as, as to like who could bake the most patriotic cake. <laughs> could you imagine in the year 2022? Like it, it would be unheard of, right? Um, so I, I, I just grew up with like a strong reverence of this mm -hmm. country. I, I've become more religious and more religiously traditional as I've gotten older, but growing up, I was in a fairly secular household. I would say patriotism almost was like the household civic religion of sorts. Yeah. So I really love this country. I think the debate that, that a lot of conservatives are having now is whether our interpretation of the American founding, or at least kind of a strong, hard line, perhaps even straw man at times version mm. of that, has come to predominate at the expense of other visions of it, right? Mm. So, for example, you know, kind of take like my neck of the woods that professionally I kind of hail from a little bit, kind of like the legal side. You know, I think it's very telling, right, that that the silhouette of the, of the Federal Society, and look, I do Fed stock speeches, and I'm friends with all those guys, True. but I think it's very telling that the silhouette for the logo is James Madison when it's just, it's not obvious to me that his thoughts should should predominate at the expense of some of, his, of some of his rivals, right? The American mm -hmm. founding was actually a very complex phenomenon. There were all these different strands of thought. Um, you know, there are, there are some kind of true Enlightenment rationalist, classical liberals there, obviously, your Thomas Jefferson, your Thomas Paine. There are also some folks like John Adams, Alexander mm -hmm. Hamilton, John Jay, who are really kind of more kind of in like that Anglo-American common law revering Burkean strain. So I, I think what I've mm -hmm. been doing over the past few years, especially is kind of the Trump uprising happened, obviously. And, you know, the opioid crisis and just the, the death of the American manufacturing, the Rust Belt, a lot of us are just thinking, hmm, have we kind of, have we gotten to the point where we, we, where we have started to fetishize kind of rationalist abstractions at the expense of kind of a concrete health of the people focus? And that kind of gets back to the old school debates back in the 50s, right? I yeah. mean, you know, when National Review got started, they had these debates, obviously. I, I, I mean, you know, the paleocons, you know, the neocons, they were all sparring it out. And like you said, I think the movement has always had room for those. That's right. But I'm starting to just think a little more carefully as whether we've started to err on the side of some wings movement too heavily as at the expense of others. Yeah. Why, well, man, you're, you're so eloquent. I really do mean that. And, and when we first spoke, which was was several months ago now, that's hard to believe, we realized on some policy areas 
there might be some daylight between us and and that's totally okay i mean as, as i told you as we were preparing for the podcast the whole point of my sitting down and doing this an hour a week is is not to advocate for specific heritage principles but just to have conversations and i think that's one of the reasons that people see you as one of the emerging leaders of the movement is that you're willing to have conversations i mean i have noticed on twitter you're willing to poke back and i i, I like that about <laughs> perhaps, you. That, a, that's perhaps a, a little too much to be honest well, yeah that's up to you but the, i, I kind of like it i mean that's that's part of our discourse. It's still within the parameters of civility. But where I was going with that was to ask a, a, a quick question, which is a put you on the spot question. And so just be prepared. But it's coming from, from a friend. But then I'll get to a larger question. The put you on the spot question, what I'm serious about this is, if not Madison as the, the figurehead icon for the Federalist Society, our friends, if I forced you to select a founder, who would you replace Madison with? For federal size specifically, yep. probably jo- probably Chief Justice John Marshall. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he wrote Marbury versus Madison. You know, yeah. I mean, he I mean he he established the judiciary really more than anyone else. I think. Yeah. Okay. And can I geek out as a historian with course, you, early America? Okay. Yeah. That's that's really why I like you. Is you let me do that. Um, who's your favorite founder? Probably Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Um, I think John Jay's up there, but yeah. I mean Hamilton. He was so prolific, right? He, yeah. he, wrote, he wrote the majority of the Federalist Papers. Obviously, I think he was totally posthumously vindicated on his on his views, not just jurisprudentially, but on on manufacturing and political economy in general. I mean, the fact that America has become such a commercial superpower, with all due respect to Thomas Jefferson, it's not due to Jefferson. It's really due to Hamilton's vision. Yeah. I think. By the way, just for the record, people ask me this question all the time, and I've been purposefully a little evasive about it. Uh, I agree with you 100. percent I think yeah, I respect all of the founders. And and I think that one of the many brilliant things you've already said already in our conversation is reminding us how complex the American founding yeah. was and is as an ideal, right? But if I were forced to select, I would say Hamilton for the reason that you mentioned. It actually leads me to a larger question that I wanted to get back to because one of the rabbit trails I went down a moment ago took us away from an important point I think you were making about political economy. And you just made it again in reference to Hamilton. Explain what you mean by that for people who probably follow you philosophically, but are trying to unpack what that means in 2022. Sure. So I think what it means is that not all industries are necessarily created equal. Mm-hmm. Um, the economy cannot necessarily be divvied up neatly into kind of retail, into kind of professional services, legal services, financial services, manufacturing, the entire kind of smorgasbord, if you will, of possible industries. I don't think all industries of the economy are created equal. It kind of reminds me of that mm. famous quote. I don't remember who said it. It was someone in the Bush 41 White House. It might have been kind of a top economist or economic advisor who famously said kind of computer chips, potato chips, what's the difference, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, as long as we're pursuing free trade and, you know, Ricardian equivalents. Look, I mean, you know, Kevin, I majored in economics in college. Okay? I went to Duke. I, I had a pretty decent economics education. I actually worked here in D.C. for two years doing economic research between college and law school. I actually went to University of Chicago because of its kind of law and economics yeah. curricular focus. I mean, they yeah. kind of developed that whole thing That's back right. in the 1960s and 70s. So I, I, you know, I think I'm on decent ground to make certain points here. The point is, from like a macro kind of GDP maximizing perspective, it's true. I mean, you know, we should pursue kind of free trade, kind of let the ends, you know, like a comparative advantage, all that, you know, and, and it'll work out. The chips fall where they may. The problem is, I think that economists don't necessarily run the United States of America. Politicians run the United States of America, and they are called to pursue certain ends. And the economists' input are important to those ends, the same way that kind of the biomedical security states, Dr. Fauci, their input's all very important. But, you know, when people say trust the science, well, you know, with all due respect, first of all, they're Obviously, as we've seen, they oftentimes played very fast and loose with, with what the lowercase s science versus uppercase s science right. is. But even if even if they were 100% accurate on the science, scientists don't dictate public policy because public policy and the art of politics, going back to the Greeks and Romans, is a very complicated subject. So, you know, this is kind of my broader criticism, I think, of kind of the three cheers for capitalism mentality as opposed to kind of a more Irving Crystal two, maybe two and a half cheers. Mm. Is I think we've just fetishized kind of these numerical ends like GDP at the expense of kind of just the health of human beings. And look, I mean, I went to law school in Chicago, like I said, I, I've, I've done that drive from the East Coast to Chicago numerous times from Chicago down to Texas. I've, I've, I've driven across the country a lot, honestly. I've actually stayed in Toledo, Ohio numerous times, like in the same hotel, This actually. means you're a real American. Well, I, I mean, now, now I'm sitting here, like I live in Miami, Florida. I don't know if that counts, but I mean, uh, but like, I, look, I spent a lot of time in, in the Midwest yeah. is what I'm trying to say. And it's very difficult to drive around the Midwest and like, look at these old abandoned towns and like think about like the depths of yep. the opioid crisis, the fentanyl crisis. It's actually it's personal to me, actually. My, my cousin 
tragically overdosed and died from fentanyl laced cocaine about four and a half years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I just have to wonder whether all these deaths of despair and just mm-hmm. tearing apart our ability to make goods, whether it was all short sighted. And you know, Hamilton, back in his opinion on the report of manufacturers back in 1791, I'm not gonna say he saw it all coming. That's giving yeah. him a little too much credit, but he saw a lot of it coming. I think. Yeah, he really did. And 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 I think one of the things that we're grappling with, and I mean that in the, the best sense of that that verb, as conservatives, is what it means for us to properly put in its place the free market, which is a good, uh, and perhaps even gets us to the common good, but to weigh that in light of these these new threats to the common good. You talk about the opioid crisis. We see something that 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 troubles me deeply because I'm a teacher at heart. Is the the spate of suicides of yeah. you know for a long time among teenage boys, and now we're seeing that that's that's bad enough as as anyone would agree with. We're seeing a, a huge spike in suicides among uh, young women in their early 20s. Some unfortunately some some famous sports players. All of that points to in addition to whatever the individual circumstances were whatever the individual circumstances were with your cousin, to a larger social trend, which is that there is something sick in America. And that's something that I mean, I would like to think is neither a liberal nor a conservative right. statement, right? right? That we should, we love this country so much and we love our fellow human person so much that this ought to trouble us. And and I've got a particular critique that, that I'll make later, but I'm going to stop there and just ask you to react to that. Uh, I mean, anything specifically? In, yeah, in, in, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I mean, at the end of the day, really really, what's going on in America, I mean, look, the column that I wrote way at the beginning of COVID, I think back to, this was April 2020. I wrote, I was just looking around, it was just so depressing what was happening, obviously, with this pandemic and seeing our over-reliance on our arts geopolitical foe. And I wrote this column that mm-hmm. I just kind of came from the heart. And I said, like, there's nothing better that could happen to America than another great awakening, right? And that yeah. kind of that kind of makes me sound like a crotchety old social conservative, but it happens to be true. I mean, there really is kind of a spiritual mm-hmm. rot, and I think a quest for a yearning and meaning at the mm-hmm. core of Americans today. And a large part of that, obviously, is that is the the decline of the church, the, the decline of kind of traditional religious traditional religious institutions in general. But look, here's the thing. I was actually tweeting about this literally this morning in the context of, of the Roe versus Wade potential ruling uh, that's coming soon. I, I, I think some people in the in, in, in the movement have gotten too obsessed with the idea, and you know, the late Andrew Breitbart famously said this, right? That that um that culture is always uh, upstream of politics, mm-hmm. right? I'm not sure that's true. Um, I, I I think it's a two way arrow, really, right? Mm-hmm. I think I, I think the law can absolutely help affect and shape culture, just as culture can help affect and shape law. And I think that's probably one of the big differences, right, between what I would kind of call a more muscular conservative, you know, as mm-hmm. I as I sit here with not exactly bulging muscles, um, and kind of a more kind of like a, a, a more standard kind of classical liberal mm-hmm. sorts, right? Is it, is an understanding that law can actually shape culture. And look, there's something important, and you know, I, I watched your conversation with with our mutual friend Oren Cass a few months ago. I thought mm-hmm. it was a fantastic conversation. What Oren has written about, I think, prolifically is the inherent dignity of labor, the inherent yeah, dignity right. of jobs. Beautifully, actually. Beautifully, yeah. right? And specifically, like, the inherent dignity of, like, going into a workplace, especially kind of, like, for a man in particular, mm-hmm. right? Because we've seen, if nothing else, the decline of masculinity, the, the decline of a man's ability to provide for his family. Just the inherent dignity of a man going to work and, like, physically toiling, right? Yeah. I mean, like, in manufacturing really encapsulates that more than anything it else does. there. So, I mean, you talk about like ways a law can shape culture, if you kind of take that to its logical conclusion, then kind of a an industrial policy of sorts, maybe not, you know, don't go extreme, obviously, but mm-hmm. some some industrial policy measures could potentially then downstream kind of trickle and affect culture to potentially kind of revive a more kind of Potter familias kind of men of the household style mentality. It's admittedly a bit of a stretch, but I think it logically follows. Well, I don't think it's a stretch. I think it's it's and I and I really do mean that genuinely. I think it's the the difficulty comes in this, and you know, I'm not being argumentative. I mean, Orrin and I disagree on the logical extension of this point, but as as great friends. That that I think where the rubber meets the road in the policy sphere is, what does that look like at the federal level? I'm not necessarily posing that question to you. I'm, I'm responding mostly in a, in a positive way to say, I think if as conservatives, being a Kirkian, being a Burkean, we remember that at the core of our set of principles 
is the belief that the common good emerges from men and women living virtuously, living harmoniously, right. whether as husband and wife or as neighbors or as friends or as associates or as people who are negotiating in a market. Right. And that everything flows from that. The And I'm not even talking about culture being upstream from the law, although we might come back to that. What I mean is the Aristotelian understanding that – this so much predates the centralized power here in Washington, D.C. And as conservatives, we have gotten so caught up in what establishment capital R Republicans say right. is our orthodoxy. Right. And, you know, that's that's a landmine that I'm planting in this conversation that that won't make everyone happy. But, you know. The truth is the truth. And I think we as conservatives have to understand, have to figure out rather, how we reincorporate some folks who are fetishizing the free market as an end unto itself rather than an outgrowth of community and make sure that we're putting in balance all of these proper goods so that we can get back to having policy conversations about the extent of, of industrial policy, the extent of a Hamiltonian agenda. But all of that to say, um, the, you know, the man of the month is J.D. Vance. And, and right. you know, we're not going to get in any partisan conversation. That's not your domain. It's certainly not mine. But I mentioned something publicly a couple nights ago when he won the primary. And I could say something public because it, it was not an endorsement that he's a cultural figure. Yeah. He's a cultural figure for me yeah, and right. any working class conservative. Because if you read Hillbilly Elegy, at least when I did, I said, man, that, that sounds like where I grew up, which was not Appalachia, but working class Louisiana in the, in the aftermath of an oil bust where the only thing going was faith and family and community. Government was part of the problem. So what I'm going to ask you to do is all of those points, believe it or not, are connected to the question. And that is sort of look into your crystal ball for the conservative movement. And do you see conservatism moving in the direction of the kinds of things that J.D. Vance and other leaders, political and otherwise, are saying? So the, the short answer is yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, full disclosure, JD's a friend. I like him a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, you know, we're not, we, we should not get into the partisan elements, but sure. I, 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 I was technically neutral on that race because I've also known Josh Mandel for a very long sure. time. But I, I, I adore JD. A lot of great people in that race. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a crowd of feel. But that's right. JD and I are both on the American Moment Board of Advisors together mm -hmm. with our friend Saurabh Sharma. So I, I love JD. I think he'll be a fantastic U.S. senator. The short answer to your question is, I think yes. I mean, you know, um, you know, I, I, I am friendly with, with Blake Masters out in Arizona as well. That's a crowded primary. Blake's mm -hmm. not guaranteed to win it, obviously. I mean, uh, Bernovich or Jim Lamone or however, I can't remember how to pronounce his name. I think it's Layman. Uh, what, you know, one of them might win, but I think mm -hmm. Blake Masters definitely, if he wins, will be another voice adding to that fray. I, or, you know, I look at folks like Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, who to an extent are kind of already there, right? I mean, yeah. Marco Rubio, I think, or at least the current iteration of Marco Rubio is certainly very much there. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be where the momentum is mm -hmm. um but 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 you know it, it's hard to say right because the donor class uh, on the right is is not there right mm -hmm. as a matter of policy the donor class i think is very content to sign checks to a lot of more kind of boilerplate kind of classical liberal libertarian organizations that aren't necessarily willing to kind of get their hands dirty and mm -hmm. kind of those like messy icky culture war issues i'm not gonna like name names as far as like specific donors or sure. anything but um, as far as like the momentum on the ground, especially when I go to campuses, right? Like, like when I kind of give some of these talks, whether it's in a law school setting or a college setting, I, I really kind of try to like look around and try to see like what lines get the most nodding headlines. Hmm. It really is some of these kind of working class lines. Completely. I, I mean, Blake Masters on the campaign trail, I think it was a few months ago, he, like he, he had this line, he made a whole video about it, how you should be able to raise a family on one income, right? Yeah. And you know, I've adopted that in some of my speeches too, and like that gets a genuine applause. Yeah. People want that. Yeah. Like, like they want it in America where two parents are not forced to work because you know what, at the end of the day, raising children is like a priority. Yeah. And I think I, I think entire generation of kind of like the GDP matter maximizing, fetishizing mm -hmm. types kind of forgot that. Yeah. But I, 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 to answer your question, I do think that is roughly where we're headed, yes. Yeah, thanks. Well, gosh, we could spend a couple hours talking about that. But what I'll do for the sake of the conversation is is move on to the issue that has has brought you to to Heritage today, and that is this panel on big tech censorship. And, and, and of course, as you and I understand, and I'm sure our smart audience does, it's very connected to the conversation we're having yeah. because – at least for, for me, as I set you up for, for highlighting whatever you're going to talk about in the panel today, 
when I arrived at Heritage, I saw in our organization the same struggle, and I say that collegially, as, as I saw at the organization I was leading in Texas, which is as a conservative organization, we were struggling with this new reality of how do you address the problems that big tech are, uh, big tech companies are causing? And I don't just mean with censorship per se, I mean the larger issue of being really manipulative about, about our behaviors and about how we change the way we live in ways that um, actually are just for the sake of their, their profit bottom line. But all of that to say, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the movement of beginning to come to grips with that. There's not, of course, unanimity of opinion, but there never is on anything. Right. I just think that in the last three or four months, it seems as if there's an emerging consensus that, A, this is a problem, B, we have to fix it, and C, at least from, from my vantage point and that of my colleagues here at Heritage, that can include something as provocative for conservatives and our libertarian friends as using antitrust. I, I want to have a conversation thread here with you about big tech per se, but I also want to have a conversation about what big tech represents outside the realm of the law, outside the realm of antitrust for us just as people. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, a uh, lot to unpack there, obviously. So, I mean, the big tech topic is, is I'm happy to be here at Heritage to talk about, it, obviously. It's, it's a topic that I talk about all the time. I actually, I was out in Silicon Valley a month and a half ago. I literally gave an anti-big tech screed, like in Mountain <laughs> View, California, uh, probably, probably, probably like a mile from Google's headquarters. It kind of it kind of felt cool to be out there. So, look, the censorship stuff, all that, I think, is totally downstream of actually the overarching, like, thematic, mm -hmm. like, like heavy hitting stuff. The way that I view the big tech issue is fundamentally one of sovereignty. It is like mm. who who writes the rules, who controls the public square, who controls the actual means that we kind of communicate and interact with with one another as humans. When you think when you look at things like the Facebook marketplace, the Amazon marketplace, I mean, who are these unaccountable Silicon Valley bureaucrats who at least you know, pre-Elon Musk seemed to kind of unilaterally subscribe to the more or less same political persuasion. Who are they to control who can kind of access which items, who can disseminate which ideas, mm -hmm. who can obviously choose to put their thumb on the scale algorithmically without any kind of, you know, a, a sunlight disinfectant style kind of exposure whatsoever there. So I kind of view it as fundamentally a question of who is writing the rules to control our own destiny as a free people. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, if the sovereignty of, you know, go back to my constitutional lawyers, uh, background. If the sovereignty of which we the people in the preamble means anything, I think it means that we should be able to write the rules that control our own public square. And I, I genuinely do believe, and it seems like Elon Musk does believe as well, that, mm -hmm. that these social media platforms are a 21st century public square. The other big point is I think Big Tap is, is very, it's really just the tip of the spear actually as to what I think is really going on in America these days, which is this effort from what I've referred to kind of borrowing from the late great Angela Cotavella as, as a ruling class that is really trying to effectively not just deplatform, but honestly unperson, like increasingly yeah. like half of America. Mm -hmm. We really start to see it with, with the truckers in Canada, with the financial institutions. I think debanking is really mm -hmm. is, is very quickly becoming, perhaps it already actually is, the next deplatforming. Um, you know, I, I actually saw Laura Loomer at, at, at the D'Souza premiere last night, and mm -hmm. I think people can think of Laura whatever they want, but like, she, she, you know, she, on a personal level, but she was she was unpersoned from PayPal, Venmo, all those institutions for years ago. She literally cannot transact. I mean, that is yeah. crazy. It is crazy. And if you think they're going to stop- the United States of America. Yeah, and, and if you think they're going to stop with Laura <laughs> Loomer, I mean, these are the same people that thought in 2017 that Facebook and Twitter would stop with Alex Jones. We saw, you know, the, the yep. former president of the United States is now banned on social media. Yep. So um, I think big tech is very much just the tip of the spear of a mm -hmm. broader conversation that we on the right have to have about kind of this bifurcated two-tier society between the ruling class and the deplorables and what that means vis-a-vis -vis conservatives' approach to state power potentially to prevent that unraveling from happening. Yeah, so that leads me to, and I agree with with, with all of that, especially your, your reference to our, our uh, late luminary friend, Angelo, Cotavilla. To a question about policy, so let's presume that the next president of the United States, whomever he or she may be, is conservative. And and what would you recommend to that person and their administration be their top two or three policy priorities? On the big tech issue specifically? Uh, no, it could be oh. big tech, but just more broadly. That that Because what made me think about that was your comment that it isn't just the big oh, tech censorship per se, but it's there. there's a larger issue there, including debanking. So on any policy areas. Yeah. So it's top three. Wow. Um, tough question, right? So look, I mean, I, I mean, not to like totally shift gears, but I mean, one issue that I've been like remarkably consistent on ever mm. since kind of college is immigration. I think I, yeah. I, I think immigration continues to be like a massive touch touch point issue, obviously. Um, in many ways, it's kind of the issue that touches everything else. It touches obviously security, sovereignty, economics, um, a culture, language, literally mm. everything, right? 
I mean, look, I, I say that obviously, I mean, I'm Jewish. My parents came here from 1880s to 1920 over the course of the kind of the great Ellis Island immigration sure. wave. But the, historically speaking, if you go back and look, you know, so the Ellis Island immigration wave ended around 1921. In the Calvin Coolidge administration in the 1920s, they, they put a hard moratorium because it was just well understood that after this massive influx, you had to then spend some meaningful time assimilating immigrants. Right. If I'm not mistaken, that actually passed the House on a voice vote, I it think. Did? So pretty crazy stuff. And yeah. like to this day, we have not had anything remotely similar to that after the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, you know, the great kind of child of, of the late Ted Kennedy. So I think it's probably time for something closely approximating a pretty close to full on moratorium on, on immigration. Like I, I would be okay with some very limited kind of high skilled immigration, perhaps, but but, yep. but drastically lowering legal immigration. In, 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 of course, in addition to getting our border illegal immigration under control. Right. But yeah, I think the big tech issue would, would be very high in my list of mm-hmm. priorities for the next Congress, the next Republican president to tackle. It's got the, you know that that would include Section 230, antitrust, potential common carrier regulation, mm-hmm. especially for a platform like Facebook. Um, you know, the, the specific kind of hodgepodge or basket of remedies for the various company, I, I think is you know that, that involves getting into the weeds a little bit there. Yeah. But um, look, we 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 have to fix Section 230. I mean, that 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 seems like a very reasonable place to start, right? That should it be does. that should be very low hanging fruit. Yeah. I think we've also consistently misinterpreted Section 230. By the way, not just not just at a policy level. But as Justice Thomas has now written numerous times, I think we've actually really misinterpreted. I mean, Eugene Volk, the UCLA law professor, had an excellent law review article last summer with Professor Adam Candube of Michigan State, basically arguing that the so-called Good Samaritan provision that uh, that has been interpreted to allow the tech platforms virtual free reign to censor at their discretion is just a total botching of, of, of rudimentary canons of statutory construction. I agree with that. Yep. Um, so, the, you know, those are just two issues that come that come immediately to mind. The third one, if I had to name a quick one, mm-hmm. would be we've got to economically disentangle angle from China. I mean, like, we, yeah. we just have to, no matter how hard that is going to be, even if it's going to raise prices for consumers for the mid to long term security and durability of this country, we have to get to the point where China does not have the sort of Damocles hanging around our neck for our most basic goods. I mean, it, that has to happen. I think. Yeah. On that, I, like all of all of what you mentioned there, I want to key in on the China <clears throat> point because we haven't really talked about that yet. Do you think that not just a majority of conservatives, but a majority of Americans will finally get there in recognizing the threat that the Chinese Communist Party poses. And and I say that not casting stones, because so I think I mentioned to you when we first spoke last fall that, you know, I'm a recovering neocon. Um, I'm, you know, not quite someone who ever, ever fetishized the free market, but I, I certainly believed as it relates to China that American interests were in a sort of American goodwill and American market was going to make China look more like us. And in fact, what's happening, including with people in power in Washington, D.C., is that we are becoming agents, whether willing or unwilling, of the CCP. Do you think that, in fact, this can, as as uh, another conservative leader, Newt Gingrich, likes to say recently, be the clarifying issue of our age? I mean, I think I think China is the issue of our time, without question. Yeah. I mean, I think China, is, as currently constituated, arguably poses a greater threat to America than the Soviet Union did at the height of the Cold War. Um, I really don't think that's an exaggeration. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree fully with that. Yeah, I they they honestly probably are. I mean, the Soviet Union yeah. had a had a larger pound for pound nuclear arsenal. But China has a massive military, obviously, in their own right. They're expanding all over the region. The Belt and Road Initiative is a harrowing, harrowing new thing that's going on. And they're deep into the heart of Europe, the Middle yep. East. They're in our own hemisphere. Will Americans wake up to it? Look, I mean, if COVID didn't do that, that's just not going to happen, right? I mean, I think people no. are I think people are slowly starting to get it, um, I, especially kind of these images that are coming down as to what the CCP is doing in Shanghai with these lockdowns. I mean, these sirens that are going over the city, like control your soul's desire to be free, like, oh. Oh my I God. Know. I mean, like, and to your point, like the thesis like economic liberalization can lead to political liberalization. I agree. I can totally see why when Nixon went to China back in the nineteen seventies, why that might have been kind of a prevailing, perhaps even pervasive yeah, makes sense. theory. It, it makes some degree of mm-hmm. sense, right? I mean, it's not it's not crazy. I think in many ways that idea kind of was what was what was underlying kind of the you know, bipartisan neoliberal consensus of the 1990s, the Bush 41 presidency, the Clinton presidency, Bush 43, kind of that era was kind of defined by this like neoliberal idea, the Fukuyama thesis, obviously, yeah. that that if you liberalize, you democratize and you will have fewer wars, fewer conflicts. But we've just empirically seen that it just doesn't necessarily work that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, authoritarian Russia is very much on the prowl. China has never been more powerful whatsoever. 
So I, you know, I don't know, right? I, I, I mean, I think we have to be a little more sober. And if conservatives stand for, if, if conservatism means anything, if like good old Berkey and Kirky and conservatism means anything, I think it is prioritizing kind of an empirical observation of what is and what is not, as opposed to what hmm. should be and what should not. And what is the case is that economic liberalization with China just has not worked. And you know, at some point along the way, I think we kind of just the ruling class in general, I think, made a value judgment that we were going to prioritize kind of consumers at the expense of producers, right? I mean, that's kind right. of what, that's kind of what free trade gets to. But I guess to kind of you know go back again to the political economy stuff, which I, which I can't seem to escape. I guess it's, it's on my mind today. I, I, I just think that value judgment is probably time to to be reassessed a little mm. bit. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So the the issue this month in Washington D.C. and around the country is the Roe versus Wade decision. We've 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 glanced on that, but I want to <clears throat> address it with you, especially given your legal experience, and not even so much the leak, although that's very troubling as it as it pertains to the integrity of the of the court. But really, the reality that it seems as if we are on the cusp of a major pro life victory. Comment on any part of that, but in particular the following part of the question. I have this thesis that the summer of 2022, whenever the final decision is rendered, if it looks like the draft opinion, is going to make 2020 look like child's play. And and I, in 2020, was caught in one of those violent protests around the White House here in Washington, D.C. Was not harmed, but there were moments when I thought that would happen as I was walking four blocks from the White House to the hotel. I think that the radical left is so unhinged and so willing to engage in violence that as a country, we have to be prepared that in the aftermath of what looks like a very favorable decision toward Roe that is eliminating it, that the repercussions of that socially in the near term will be pretty violent. Well, well, that's a black pill. Um, I, 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 I mean, hopefully these fiery but mostly peaceful protests will still be mostly peaceful, though, right? Yeah. I mean, um, but look, wow. Um, but it wasn't, you know, two blocks from here, three blocks from here at the Supreme Court the other night when yeah. a handful of, of radical left protesters shouted out and pushed out some very peaceful praying students from Catholic University yeah, of America. Right. I don't mean to be a pessimist. I'm no, just no, no, saying no, it, it no, 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 no. Look, I, I, I fear you're probably right, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, it honestly is like a situation like this where I, I am grateful to live in a state like Florida, which kind of... You oh, you're thinking you live in Miami, you have nothing to worry about. Well, not just, I mean, Miami obviously is like a more politically mixed city. We, yeah. we, we actually have a Republican mayor, Francis Suarez, very yeah. mo very moderate Republican. But I'm more thinking that like, you know, if, if we actually get where there's like anarchy in the streets, I, I, I trust our governor to yeah. at least kind of call up like the, the I, militia. I trust your governor too. Right. So it's, so this is like when, when, when you say a situation like that, I'm kind of yeah. grateful to live there. Look, it, I mean, it probably will get ugly, right? Yeah. I mean, the problem obviously is that the left rules by mob, mobocracy. I mean, yeah. they rule obviously by like the rule of, of, of the strong, the rule of, of the tyranny, the majority. Lincoln, yet again, was so prescient to this, obviously. I mean, he, mm -hmm. sp I mean, he spoke famously in his uh, Lyceum address, if I'm not mistaken. He famously condemned the idea of rule by mob. He obviously had no idea that 20 years later he would be facing the quintessential mob, obviously, in terms of like the greatest yeah. insurrection uh, in American history by orders of magnitude. But this is this is this is not who we are. It really it really viscerally kind of makes me angry. I mm -hmm. mean, a recurring theme in my commentary for many years has been kind of criminal justice reform and kind of like taking a more kind of tough law and order stance, and just the idea of people just wantonly, flagrantly violating the rule of law, riots, protests. It really makes my blood boil, honestly, yeah. in a way that few other issues do. I can't quite describe it to you. I mean, like my first reaction to, uh, you know, after the death of George Floyd, I was living in Dallas at the time, in Dallas, mm -hmm. Texas, my local Whole Foods, I mean, they smashed the windows. I, I, I was just livid. I, I, yep. I, I, I spent this one day on Twitter and like I was just tweeting rage. And I, I, I said, the way, it's like, you, Josh, you just can't do this. I mean, this is not healthy. Just like go calm down. Like, don't walk outside because it was dangerous, but just like take a pace, Get off of Twitter pace, and walk outside. pace around the apartment or something. <laughs> um, so the thought of what you're saying, like it really, it really makes me uh, deeply discomfited in like a profound way. But you're honestly probably right because tragically that's where we are. And we're there obviously because the left just controls all the institutions of power in this country. Right. So they are terrified of the prospect of one major decision at one institution that they do not control going the wrong way. They control everything, everything, except for the political, the actual politics, like, like our political branches are a little more politically divided. The Supreme Court in particular, obviously, because of President Trump tends to lean in our direction. So they're just terrified, obviously, of one institution yeah. out there that, that that does not belong to them. It's yeah, it just, it just shows you that this, this one exception to their institutional control 
is is that problematic for them? So as we begin to wrap up here, one of the last questions I have for you is about American institutional life. I've taken in the last five or six weeks to be talking a lot more about that, and and not just as it relates to heritage, because in addition to doing policy work, of course, we're involved in American institutional life, but really just as a dad, you know, as, as someone who thinks about the future of America and the fact that while in the near term, I think things will get ugly. I am optimistic. I think we, our institutions will weather that our law enforcement will weather that even, I think our, some politicians left of center will help weather that, but it leads me to the question for conservatives. We have to get about the business of rebuilding institutions. I mean, yeah. I, I even said in a recent speech in Dallas that someone asked me the question, well, you know, what do you do about institutions of higher education that are are problematic? I said, it's time to kick them into the sea. I mean, it's I'm not arguing for violence, obviously, just to be clear. But I think we almost have to get to the point where we give up on those institutions that are not helpful and really lean into materially, you know, with our professional credibility, these new institutions, whether they be in education or other sectors of, of society that at least are neutral. I mean, I don't, Elon Musk is no conservative, but right. if all he does is return Twitter to being a neutral platform, yeah. that's all we want, right? We don't need it to be conservative. So is that the kind of project that some conservatives need to be thinking about in addition to all of the other work that we're doing? Yeah. So look, I mean, I, we, we have to be doing multiple things at the same time. We have to be kind yeah. of walking. It's not either or. Yeah, we have, yeah. I think we have to be kind of walking and chewing gum at the same time, as they say, right? So we have to be obviously be building our own institutions. I mean, we, we see a lot of that. There's We have our think tanks. We have kind of our publications. You know, we're starting to maybe see the rise of some more of our universities and some of that. The internet infrastructure piece of this is really interesting, right? Because what happened in Parler, obviously, with Apple and Google and Amazon showed that unless you control kind of the actual cloud service, unless you have an equivalent to Amazon Web Services, you're probably not going to get very far. Yeah, so, that's right. you know, Chris Bedford and the folks at RightForge are actually working on this right now. Mm -hmm. That is so important. It I is. think RightForge is, is an indispensable component of this broader, like, kind of build our own element of the right. At the same time, we can't just totally forsake the common area and kind of, you mm -hmm. know, full, you know, Roger as a friend, but we can't go full Benedict option, like, fully, like, retreat to, like, our proverbial kind of corner of society. We have, we have to engage I and mean, yeah. we, we have to be a part of mainstream institutions because for better or for worse, you know, a university like Yale or Harvard, that cr their credentialing power, mm -hmm. that's the signaling mechanism of a degree from those institutions, that's not going to go away anytime soon. I mean, we would probably prefer it to go away, but yeah. it's just not. So we, we can't just unilaterally just give up on the game. We have to find a way to play it. And one way, one way to view that as well is kind of, I think what I'm doing in Newsweek, honestly, I mean, mm -hmm. Newsweek historically is kind of a liberal institution um, or at least liberal leaning, but, you know, I've, I've been able to kind of find a perch. I'm not saying that's like easily kind of, uh, e you know, easily kind of, uh, a replicated example of sorts. I mean, it might be kind of a it's rare a thing, but it's a good example. Yeah. Right? I mean, like if you if you can find a diamond in the rough like this the situation that I have and kind of find a historically liberal institution, but find a way to infiltrate it from within and then kind of put your ground there, I, we have to play that game too, to be honest with you. So the, yeah, we, I think it's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I I, uh, I I welcome the correction on that. So um, it's it's good that for once. Um, maybe in the conversations we've had, I'm the radical and you're correcting me, right? <laughs> <laughs> just just pick it on you. Uh, last question for you, which I try to ask all of our guests, and uh, you you may want to be less optimistic than, than others, but that, and that would be okay. But, you know, you're here in DC. That tells me that you think there's hope in spite of everything that's that's against us. You love America. You have this wonderful family story as, as all of us, you know, uh, sons, grandsons, uh, daughters of, of immigrants. Why did you wake up optimistic about the American future in spite of all of our challenges? Look, at the end of the day, uh, not only is our rule of law the most durable, right? I mean, I will kind of cite like my constitutional training here. I mean, the, con the Constitution really is the greatest political charter that hmm. man has ever had, right? Ever. I, I mean, there is nothing quite like it. I think some of the founders, obviously, Jefferson being a prime example, they didn't think this thing would last very long. You know, 20, 30 years. He, Jefferson had that crazy quote, obviously, about like the, you know, the, the, the blood of tyrants, the tree of liberty. I'm, I'm going to botch it. But, you know, it's, it has lasted a very long time mm -hmm. with some very important amendments, obviously, and one horrific internecine conflict in the middle because it's just it, it is such an indispensable encapsulation 
of human nature. I mean, I, I think back to Madison in Federalist 51, his famous quote about like if men were angels, right? Mm -hmm. they, the founders, I think, understood human nature at a very kind of higher level, and they codified that into our constitutional fabric there. So we have this very enduring rule of law. The other thing, though, at the end of the day, America still has the best institutions. Now, I worry greatly, obviously, about China, and, and you know, I look at their airports, and they're so savvy. They've got yeah. the, Asia; they have the high-speed rail. I've taken the high-speed rail in Japan, 230 miles per hour. It's amazing. But at the same, but but, but having said, like, you know, American institutions, like our high, our education institutions, our medical institutions, you know, there's a reason why, like, mm. if, if you're in Canada, if you, if you need a if you need a kidney transplant, you still want to come to the United States to do it, obviously, because we still have the best healthcare. We still have the best human capital in this country. And as decrepit and, you know, as miserable as our state of actual kind of day-to-day -day politics and mudslinging might be, I, I, I do take solace in the durability of our enduring charter, our constitution, and the fact that we have such great institutions and such an innovative, resourceful people. I love that response. Thanks for it. And thanks for all the work you do. Thanks for taking time of out of your busy schedule, of Josh Hammer, and joining me. Anytime, Kevin. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you did and you would like to hear or see more of these, please subscribe to the show. Give us a good rating. And we'll, of course, continue to follow Josh and the great work that he does. Take care.